Haksamea, a beautiful feast. It's, uh, of course, it, it begins officially uh, tomorrow evening at sunset. Uh, for how many days? Seven plus one. Yeah. Uh, and so, as you begin to look at the scriptures and, and see the feasts, and you see that he, he implants these numbers and these things in, in so all these different places, and it's to give um, us significance. Uh, how many branches are there on the menorah? Seven. And, and how many feasts? So the eighth day is considered a, a part of, but separate, of the Feast of Sukkot, uh, which we will celebrate next Shabbat, uh, right here. Uh, it is, uh, of course, the, the kind of the culmination and, and the fullness of it. Uh, traditionally, uh, Simchat Torah is also celebrated, uh, the feast or the, the a joy in the Torah, in which we will uh, celebrate at that time. Uh, so Sukkot. Um, so what is a sukkah? Okay, a booth, a dwelling, temporary. a temporary dwelling. Uh, it could be a tent. It could be a uh, form, as we saw in, in the um, presentation, beginning of the service, uh, a kind of a, a four-sided dwelling. It could be any number of sides. Rabbi Kevin? I, I have a question. Did the Israelites bring tents with them out of Egypt, or did they get them once they were, make them once they were in the desert? I'm guessing with the urgency which with they left, um, they took everything they needed. Um, we have some um, Egyptian tent fabric uh, that we, we used here at Mishkan for years, and so we still have it in, in our storage, uh, which it, it is a traditional um, hand-blocked um, colored print. Uh, it's, it's really beautiful. If, if we can get it out sometime, uh, maybe we can put it out next week. Uh, but it's beautiful. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very traditional way that they built tents. So um, it would have been probably they took what they, what they needed with them. Uh, remember, when we left Egypt, did, did, we, did we crawl out of Egypt? How did we leave Egypt? With, with high hands praising God. And not just that, what did we do to the Egyptians? Plundered them. We took stuff, that's right. Um, we walked out with, with looking like kings. I mean, we, we took all of the, the riches, the gold, uh, the different things. And why? Because the Egyptians wanted us gone. Take it. Just leave us. Well, okay. And so we took all of the good stuff with us. So, and the first feast that God said that he wanted us to do was, was, was this feast, we anticipation. In order to celebrate this feast, something had to happen in order for us to be ready for it. And what was that? Passover. We had to be freed from bondage. We had to be freed from sin. We had to be uh, released from spiritual Egypt. Physical Egypt was, was just a type of the reality of the bondage to sin. And so likewise, when we leave bondage, uh, we sometimes, just like our people, when we get out into the desert, and, and oh, by the way, the desert is out here. It's our every day. Uh, it's, uh, oh, but, but there's, it's not hot out there. Have you stepped outside today? It's hot out there, man. And, and the desert is, is a place of what? Comfort and um, what? what? What is the desert a place of? Sparseness. Sparseness, nothing. Testing, Testing that's right. Uh, and, and the world, this world that we live in every day is, is the desert. And so just like our people, uh, we get out there and we go, oh God, did you bring us out here to kill us? Yes, he did actually. He wanted our people to die to themselves. And it's the same message that we live today. Not I that lives but Messiah who lives in me. Same message. It's just become a little bit more personal because it's inside of us. And so this feast is, is a beautiful time in which we, in just a moment, we're going to read from, from the Torah and various scriptures where it's mentioned. We're not going to read the massive portion that goes through everyday sacrifices. I'll let you uh, read that yourself. But with spiritual eyes, we begin to look back and we see the beauty, even of, of the traditional things which the rabbis have come up with, we can see that the perfect, righteous man or woman is to be like the citron. Because it has both beautiful scent and taste. Uh, if you've ever seen the, the movie uh, Ushpazin, I uh, highly recommend it. I don't recommend a whole lot of movies. But it's an Israeli film that's, that's very, very cute uh, of a, a rabbi. Uh, an Orthodox rabbi and his wife who are desperate to have a child. 
They're about on the eve of to celebrate Sukkot, and they have nothing, zero. They have, they have nothing to. They have, they have no money to buy anything. They're extremely poor, and so it's about God's providence to them, uh, and how He works. But we are to become like this, with both good deeds as well as knowledge of God. And so this is uh, again the beautiful time in which we're able to be able to look with spiritual eyes. If you turn over to Deuteronomy, please, chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 10. It said, Moses uh, commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, when all of Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before Israel in their, in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, the stranger who is in your gates. And, and who is the stranger? Alien. Okay, those that were not of Israel but had, had, had either been joined to Israel or had, been, or had become a part of, of the community. Uh, it says that they may come within the gates, that they may hear and they may learn to fear the Lord your God carefully and to observe all the words of this law. And that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land when you cross the Jordan to possess. So what, what is he saying? Just get together, um, wave a bunch of palms, and eat a lot? What was the purpose of this feast? To hear the command of God again. Yeah, to hear the command. Every year, uh, to, to be able to hear the scriptures. But, but I heard it like 20 years ago. I mean, t- do I really need to hear it today? Yeah. Because if we haven't been filling our minds and our hearts with the scriptures and the words of God, we've been filling it with something else, haven't we? Yes. And we can, I bet, I bet most of us can tell you something, a whole list of facts and trivia about things which are, well, trivial. Um, historical things, uh, baseball players, uh, football players and their stats. Man, we can whip that off, right? Yes. But the moment that we go, uh, what? What was that in, in, in Genesis? Uh, we struggle. Why? Because we've been filling our minds with that which is, is of importance to us. And so he, he's telling us to begin to, to hunger and thirst for my words so that they become a reality to you. May I ask you a question? Yes. Um, in my Bible book, well, it says at the time of the year of remission of debts. Mm-hmm. So was that the year of Jubilee that they were doing that? Yep. Yep. Uh, okay, now to Jew, uh, Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 13. It says, You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days, when you have gathered in from your threshing floor and from your wine press. You shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your maid ser- male servant and your female servant and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place where he chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all of your produce and all the work of your hands so that you will surely rejoice. So this is at the end of the harvests when, when everything has, has kind of wound down, so to speak, for the year. Uh, he, he gives us a command to rejoice and to feast before him. Oh, okay. I can do that. Uh, and, but he says, it's not just about you, but it's about the people around you. Uh, a, a tradition uh, became uh, very common among our people uh, called the Ushpazin, which was the, the kind of uninvited guest, uh, the, the one that, that shows up at the doorstep. But it also became a tradition to be able to invite people uh, over to your sukkah. Uh, in um, Israel um, and in various parts of, of the lands, pretty much all over the world where we live, people are preparing or have prepared their sukkah. Uh, there's whole Jewish neighborhoods which are filled with uh, sukkahs. Uh, but there's oftentimes people that, that either don't have the ability to or the means to be able to construct a sukkah. So it's considered um, a mitzvah or a good deed to invite people over. And sometimes, even if 
they have a place to be able to invite them. And you kind of, each night you could can, can, can spend the evening meal with a neighbor or a friend, or you invite someone who, who doesn't have the ability to do that. And it's, so Ushpazin uh, is, it's an Aramaic term uh, for, for guest. Um, and so in the movie that I mentioned, uh, the guests that show up sometimes aren't the guests that you would have preferred, but they're the guests that ultimately become uh, integral to your story. And we all have those people in our lives, sometimes people that we don't really like very much, but they're integral to our story because they cause us and we're tested by them. Uh, and they can be people in our families, they can be people in our neighborhoods, our workplaces. Uh, they're the guests that come to us. How will we receive them? So these are the things, and it says, continuing in verse 16, three times a year will all of your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses at the festival of unleavened bread, the feast of weeks, and at the feast of tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed, and every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God which he has given to you. Why does it say specifically the men to appear? Why doesn't it say everyone? Because they are the head of the households. Okay. They are the head of the households. Uh, many times uh, um, women were pregnant and it wasn't possible for them to travel. Uh, if you lived all the way on the other side of, of the country, uh, then it obviously wasn't practical for the whole families. It became so expensive and so hard to travel sometimes, as we've, we've shared in previous times. Many times the whole village would get together and would send a family or, or a group of families to be able to go represent the village, just because. Uh, did individual families travel from wherever they were to Jerusalem? Sure. Sometimes, but, but rarely. They would have gone in what we call a caravan. Uh, why, is, why are caravans important? Safety, Safety security. Shared resources. Shared resources, protection. Um, when Yeshua sent out uh, his, his, uh, his apostles and his disciples, did he say, you go alone? Oh, he, he said, go how much? Two by two. Uh, because two people, uh, there's, there's, there's safety. If one falls, the other one can lift up. But there's also the, the accountability and, and be able to encourage. What happens if, you get, um, if you're on a long hike? I can't remember the last time that happened. But, uh, and you get a blister. How does that feel? And you're, and you're 20 miles out. You think the world's going to end because... Your foot hurts. But if you have a friend who maybe brought along a first aid kit because he was or she was thoughtful and mindful, now you have, you have resources that you didn't have alone. Our community is like this caravan. And we all bring something on this journey together. And we share that with, with one another. Baruch Hashem. So this is, again, a, uh, one of the commandments. But he says that at these times that you will go um, up to the feast. Um, so, again, how many days is, is the feast? Seven, seven plus one. Seven, plus one. Uh, seven is the number of what? Perfection, Perfection completion. His feast, seven in, in particular, and there are smaller sub-feasts that are, are not considered a part of the seven, but the seven feasts, number of, of perfection, completion. Um, completeness, wholeness, the whole plan of God is, is contained within these seven feasts. We have the reminder of the menorah, which has seven branches. Uh, we have the, all these things which are, are there to, to impress upon us. Why, why did we have all these repeating things constantly happening? Because we forget. Because we forget. Because we, forget. Because we get dull-minded. We get tired sometimes. And it's important for us to be reminded of the important things. So this feast, is, is, he says, seven days, but he wants you to do an eighth day. Uh, and what is eight a number of? A new, a new beginning. Now the, the fathers constantly refer to the Lord's day, the day after the Sabbath, that he was resurrected as the eighth day. Because what happened on the eighth day at that time? We'll say it again. Okay, think about it. The resurrection. What was that? What, 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 if, we, if we were to say new beginnings in the resurrection, 
what was new and what, what began? Life once again. Okay, life once again. A restoration of the opportunity to have communion with God. When Messiah rose from the dead, he, he came back victorious. Not just victorious because he conquered hell, death, and the grave, but because he conquered it for us. And that he was happy and rejoiced because of that. Not just for his own experience. He was rejoicing for you and you and you and you and all believers, all those who would come into faith and communion with God through his sacrifice and resurrection. No resurrection, no completion. So the resurrection is, is again the eighth day and it is a time of joy because death has been conquered. We see that the Feast of Sukkot is oftentimes called um, Hag Ha'asif, the, the festival of the ingathering. Uh, why do you think it's, it's called that? Why is, is it called the festival of the ingathering? The, the fall um, harvest was taking place and the, the crops were brought in. Yep. But, but it's also a foreshadowing of the ingathering of God's people. That's right. Um, and so this is a, 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 he references, the scriptures are referenced in various things to be able to, to show us the many facets of each of the days. Uh, so Sukkot is, of course, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, Mishkan. Uh, so a temporary dwelling, a Mishkan. Um, how, how are our bodies Mishkans? What's that? Okay, have a set time. Uh, we're only here for a season. Uh, this body uh, is not uh, made out of an impermeable material. Uh, we came from the dust, and we're going to return to the dust. Uh, this body is is given to us. Um, a mishkan, um, a sukkah, uh, is is a sukkah meant to stand forever? No. Uh, how does it go up? Very quickly. Like birth. And it comes down again at the end of days, at the end, at the end of, of the time that it's allotted. And so this, our body is like this sukkah. Think of the Mishkan of Moses uh, in the desert. What, what, what was the purpose of the Mishkan? Portability. Yep, portability, movability. What else? What, were all other things, the altar of incense and the... Met God. They met with God? And where was the most important part of the Mishkan? Holy of Holies. Okay, at the heart of the whole community was this place. And at the heart of the Mishkan was this place that, that was so sacred. Because, and why was it sacred? Because of the Ark itself? No, yeah. it represented the throne room of God. It was his Shekinah presence. Okay, what else? Why was it important? Why was it holy? The, the ark was, was, was a golden box, but what made it holy? Presence. His presence. The indwelling of the presence. Many times the ark was present and there was no Shekinah. There was no glory. There was no God. Um, the best and most beautiful things upon this earth, if, they're not, if God is not present, it's just a golden box. And these bodies, if there's no God present, we're just whitewashed tombs if we don't have God present within us in our hearts and our lives. And so it's this, all these things, he gives us the foreshadowing of everything in his holy Torah. Uh, but through spiritual eyes, we begin to see the purpose for those things. And so that's where we're able to reverence his purposes by seeing what, what he has provided. Uh, Numbers 29. Verse 29 and verse 12, this, of course, is all the sacrifices, which we're not going to spend going through each of them, just to kind of reference it if you would like to read it later. Numbers 29 and verse 12, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall do no customary work, and you shall keep a feast to the Lord for seven days. You shall present a burnt offering, an offering made by fire as a sweet aroma to the Lord, with thirteen young bulls, two rams, and fourteen lambs in their first year, and they shall be without blemish. Okay, if you'll slide over to verse 39. 
each of the, all the all the preceding verses are gives you all the sacrifices that were to be offered by the day on top of the daily offerings that were that were made every day regardless of the time. It says in verse thirty nine, you shall present to the Lord at your appointed feast beside your your uh, vowed offerings. In other words, that which we have said, O Lord, if you will do this, I will give that. And your freewill offerings, and your burnt offerings, and your grain offerings, and your drink offerings, and your peace offerings. So Moses told the children of Israel everything, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So we see that, that those were to be offered up and given. So why do you think the sacrifices were important? Why did God ask, why does God ask for sacrifice? Why doesn't God just do everything for us? Okay, for obedience. Okay. It was a picture of what had to be done to restore us to his presence. Yeah. I mean, have you ever asked yourself, why doesn't God just snap his fingers and make everything good? Could he do that? Sure, sure he could. But he doesn't because he wants there to be an investment for every soul to make an investment to seek and, ser- and, and, seek and serve him. Um, what did our father, the prophet David King, uh, prophet King David say when he was, and he needed to make a sacrifice, and he went to the, to the, to the reaping uh, threshing floor, and the man was like, here, take it, it's yours. This was the man's livelihood. And he said, take it, and, and, and I'll give it to you. In fact, I'll, I'll even give you the animals to sacrifice so you don't have to do anything. And what did our father David say? He says, I, I won't do it because... Okay. Because God wants our free will and you to you to come with him out of a heart of love for him, not out of a sense of obligation. Because he wants he wants our, our service really given from our heart. That's right. It's the, the saying, uh, no skin in the game. You don't have any, anything hanging, hanging in the balance here. We, have to, we, we invest. And, and, and what is our skin in the game of this life, of this journey? Our lives. Uh, we have to invest our lives into this. Uh, we can go through all the motions. and We can all do all the, all the nice Jewish stuff and have thousands of stars of David decking everything. And if there's no love... It's all worthless. There's nothing. We have to be those that are truly dying to ourselves so that we can live for him and for his purposes. Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 33. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be a feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and you shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And on the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. For these are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, a grain offering, a sacrifice and drink offering, everything on its day, besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts and besides all your vows, besides your freewill offerings, which you have given to the Lord. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. And on the first day shall be a Sabbath rest, and the eighth day a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day of on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, and branches of palm leaves, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows in the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year, and it shall be a statute forever in your generations, and you shall celebrate it in the seventh month. He keeps kind of repeating himself here, doesn't he? You kind of get the point? 
uh, it's, it's a little bit important. It's, has it been three times yet? It's something like that. He says, you shall dwell in booths for seven days, who are native Israelites shall dwell in the booths, that your generations may know that I have made the children of Israel to dwell in the booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so he tells us to do something which, through our modern eyes, we could probably go, it seems kind of silly, uh, get a bunch of like twigs and uh, like an, an orange and, and, and wave it before God. Who cares? Well, God says, do this. And he says, if you do this, what, what does he promise us? Eternal life. Okay, eternal life. He, he tells us to do silly things like, I don't know, be kind to people that hate you. And other silly things like forgive those people. It sounds kind of silly. I mean, the rational mind says, oh no, I'm right. But God says, forgive like you have been forgiven and bear fruit. And so we do these things. Uh, we, we blow the horns of uh, kosher animals out of obedience. And we do these things and it's, he blesses us through it. So I'd like to invite anybody uh, after services, if you'd like to come up um, and, and wave the lulav and, and the etrog uh, and, and, and to pray the prayer for you or for your family. Um, I'd be happy to, to stand here afterwards and, and let anybody who would like to do it. Um, again, there's nothing magic. No angels aren't going to sing. Uh, but it's, again, a way that you could, if you choose to, to honor what God has asked. Um, the, as, as most things would rather be returned to the earth, like buried, uh, many times uh, they'll uh, um, burn the uh, palm leaves and to use it as ash uh, for uh, penitence, times of, of um, repentance. Do they eat the citron or no? Oh yeah, so I don't want to ruin the end of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't ruin the end of the movie. Uh, but the, I'll just tell you, the rabbi invests like $1,000 in an etrog, what was it called? The diamond? Uh, our, our Orthodox Jewish brothers and sisters play, place great significance in the quality of these things. Sometimes it, it's for pride, but many times they, they desire it simply because they want to honor God. And so they will get the best that they can afford. Maybe it's a $5 or maybe it's a $1,000 piece. And it isn't about anything other than desiring the perfect thing to honor God with. And that's beautiful to me because that's how you and I should be approaching all the spiritual things of our lives the best we can. Why? So we, so we can hear people go, oh, you're so righteous. You're, you're, you're so good, man. No, that's all just, whew, it's gone. But the righteous words, the holy words that come from God that says, well done, save it for that. Uh, we should not be seeking the praise of people, but doing the good things that we do, forgiving people, being generous to people that maybe nobody else knows about because our Father in Heaven sees it. Amen? So this, uh, this feast, he tells us to, to, to grab these, to have these things and to be able to remember and, and to teach our children. Um, it's not about teaching our children Jewish things. It's about giving them a foundation in which to be able to learn how to live for Him. What's important to us? How do we invest? The scriptures say to read these things to, to, our, to our children and our children's children. Why do you think it was important for the, the second generation after they came out of Egypt to be able to hear the words? They didn't come out of Egypt. They didn't see the miracles. Why do you think it was important for them to hear the words? They don't have any, any experience of those things which are read here. Do, do you and I have experience of, of coming out of physical Egypt? No. But you and I do have some experience of coming out of spiritual Egypt, which is bondage and death and misery. And we have come into and are beginning to enter the promised land of God. But our children don't have the same experience of coming out of Egypt because many times maybe they haven't made that journey yet. And so we, we read the words 
and we can share our stories, but every single soul has to decide to come out of Egypt. Otherwise, they remain there. It's really important, especially if you see nowadays, we're trying to change the history books mm -hmm. and take things out that are unpleasant or, you know, it's history and man, people are trying to change it, whitewash it, whatever you want to call it. And so it's really important that this gets handed down from the role model, the figure, the parents, grandparents, whatever, to that child so that they can hear it and it not be lost like we're trying to sweep away sure. what's going on right now. Well, there are some um, churches which won't read certain parts of the Bible. Why? Because it's uncomfortable. Uh, well, we can't read that part of the Bible because it makes us uncomfortable. Um, our, our, our Jewish brothers and sisters have the same approach. They won't read certain parts of the prophets, particularly um, Isaiah. Why wouldn't they want to read that? Because they speak directly of Jesus. You can't read that with, and knowing anything about the man of Nazareth to not go, whoa. Yeah. Um, we... We, as human beings, naturally seek that which is comfortable, don't we? Um, if we go someplace, a uh, of, of church or, or a synagogue, and people, and, and, they're, and they're teaching the scriptures, which are kind of make us uncomfortable, well, what's our, 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 our natural inclination? To seek a place that makes us comfortable, right? So why do people you know, move from places that have solid, Foundations, they want the comfort. They, it says in, in the scriptures, the, the seekers after smooth things. Um, if you want, if you can, I mean, to go someplace that says, you're perfect just the way you are. Oh, wow, you're amazing. You're going to walk out of there feeling pretty good, huh? Because who doesn't want to feel amazing? But if somebody begins to say, scriptures say this and that, and we are honest enough to look inside and we go, then we're faced with a choice. Probably a couple of choices. What's choice number one? Ignore it. Ignore it? Leave. Leave? Yeah. Or repent and do something about it. Uh, avoiding sickness, you only get sicker. But you deal with the sickness and then we, you move towards healing it. Uh, do we want to be sick or do we want to be well? And his words are, th are the path of healing of our souls so that we can become without which he has desired us to become. And so he, he says in, in, in his Torah that he, he, he declares these things for us to be able to be those that are seeking him. And so we see that this was such a great festival that it was, it was, it was actually called The Feast because it was of such significance to our fathers and to the people that they would come into this tabernacling. Um, what's the most important tabernacle in the world? Yep, even greater than us. Um, there is, was a special person who came into this world. It says that the word of God was made flesh and tabernacled among us. He lived among us. He became like us. He became just like you and me, a body of flesh. And he wasn't just a body of flesh praying for, for God to, to, to dwell within him. He was God, is God, living in a human body. And he is, of course, the most, the most glorious. He was the picture of, of the perfect tabernacle. And why was he the perfect tabernacle? Think about what makes the Mishkan a Mishkan. What, what sets it apart from, from every other tent? Purpose? What else? Okay. Okay. The presence of God within it, set aside for a certain purpose. What was he above all things to the will of his Father? He was obedient. And he, he walked the path so that you and I could, could learn what it takes. So this feast, again, of 
Sukkot is a, is, a, is a super joyous time. It is called the time of our joy. Uh, and what is the ultimate joy? And where does that joy come from? Meeting with God, meeting, being with him, being in his presence. The thing which will satisfy every soul, that no amount of money, no amount of praise or honor, no amount of drugs or any other substitute will be able to do is to be into the presence of God and to bask in his presence. If you can think of the, of the happiest moment you've ever had and multiply it by a million, the best time that you ever had, the most enjoyable time, the euphoria of that experience, and you multiply it by a million, it probably won't even compare. And that's what our, our brothers and sisters experience being in his presence right now in the heavens. So Sukkot is a, a time in which we, we focus on, on, on the presence of God, on the, the dwelling, the meeting with God. Um, so there was, there was somebody that was significant um, in, the, in the working of the, of the tabernacle and later the temple. And what was that person? It wasn't Moses. Okay, and he was the high priest. Um, everything, as we saw uh, last Shabbat, or sorry, not last Shabbat, but on Tuesday when we remembered the Day of Atonement, we remembered that everything hinged upon the work of the high priest. Yes, er, the people had to bring things and had to participate in, in everything that they did, just like us. We bring things to God. We, we give, we have participation, we give our time, we give of our energy. Everything hinges upon the high priest. Who is our high priest? Yeshua. He is the great high priest, the, the Kohen Haggadol, uh, the great priest, the, the one who is perfected, has accomplished. And it is upon him, and it's why we focus upon him exclusively, because it is his obedience and his, his work. If you would please turn over to Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah. Chapter 14. This feast in this, in this time is so significant. Uh, and so we're going to take the time to, to go over this portion of, of the prophets. In verse 14, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will, will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem, and the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half the city will go into captivity. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And then the Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two, from the east and to the west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move towards the north, and half of it shall move towards the south. You shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And thus the Lord my God will come and all of the saints with you. And it shall come to pass in that day that there shall be no light and lights will diminish. It shall be one day, which is known to the Lord, which neither a day nor night, but at evening time shall it happen, that it will be light. And in that day there will be that living waters will flow from Jerusalem, and half of them towards the eastern sea, and half of them towards the western sea, and both the summer and the winter it shall occur. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be. The Lord is one, and his name is one. And all the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place, from, from uh, Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate, and from the tout of Hananel to the king's winepress. That the people will dwell in it, and no longer shall there be utter destruction but Jerusalem shall safely be inhabited. So he says that in this time, and the day of the Lord is, 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 is a type of the day of atonement, when he returns and he judges humanity at that time. 
after the, the cataclysm of his wrath, then something beautiful happens. He has to lay waste to the works of the enemy, to the ways of darkness. And in this way, he does. And But then something beautiful happens. It says in verse 12, that this shall be a plague with which the Lord shall strike all the peoples who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets. Their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. It shall come into pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. And everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and rest, raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Judah will also fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in abundance. And such also shall be the plague on the horse and the mule and on the camel and the donkey and all those cattle that shall be in the camps shall this plague be. But it shall come to pass, everyone who is left of the nations which came up against Jerusalem will go up year to year to worship the Lord, the God of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And so this is a, t- a time in which it shall be instituted that all who are left will come to Jerusalem to celebrate this, this time of, of meeting with God. That's what the ultimate meaning of uh, Sukkot is. But it says that what, whichever the families of the earth do not come up to, to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt shall not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain, and they shall receive the plague which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Why is there punishment? Okay. Uh, Are they being made to come up? No. No? Nope. Free will is free will. But God says, this is what I'm asking. If you told your children, I want you to do this, And if you don't do this, I'm going to punish you. And they don't do what you asked, and they don't get punished. What happens? Okay. And God's not a liar. What's that? And so God says, because God is is not a wishy-washy, do whatever you want, it's okay, you're awesome as you are. No, he is a God of, of love and mercy, but he's also a God of accountability. And so those that obey will be blessed. Is that hard? Is, is that a little bit, uh, is that just, you know, unreasonable of God? Uh, are, have our minds been jaded by the age that we live in that says, mm, that's a little bit harsh. I can't, no, I can't think that God would actually do something like that. I don't want to worship a God that punishes people. Or do we, those that say, God is, the Lord is God and he is one. Did Joshua say, today I set before you life and death, blessings and cursings, and and, oh, there's this gray area here that I also want to tell you about, because if you do this, then you'll probably be okay. Did did Joshua say that? Uh Right? Life and death, uh, blessings and cursings. Um, Whenever a Messiah comes to judge humanity, you've got the sheep, the goats, and the ostriches, right? Uh, Right? Because the sheep represent who? What's that? Believers, the righteous ones. And the goats represent who? The unbelievers. And the ostriches, who do they represent? People that stick their head in the ground. People that stick their head in the ground and say, everything's good. Ostriches isn't scriptural, by the way. Don't don't go looking for it in there. So don't be a goat or an ostrich, but be one of, of the chosen lambs. Baruch Hashem. So this feast, uh, which we will kick off here in just a minute, uh, to be able to, to celebrate, um, we prayed beforehand that God would, would, would flood us with a taste of his presence. That because it, it, isn't, it isn't just coming here and doing stuff. It's about God and meeting with him. Uh, it isn't a God that we read about. It's a living God. And so we just, just if you, as you pray this week even, remember your brothers and your sisters. 
Um, remember our Jewish people that are celebrating this along with us. And, and remember them and, and pray that their eyes would be opened, that they would come to see Messiah Yeshua, who is the long anticipated and desired promised one. Amen. Abba, we pray uh, over this whole earth, Lord, as our people gather, as, our, as believers gather uh, over the next few days to begin this feast, to celebrate, to be those that uh, understand the true significance of it, and Father, begin to seek you and serve you with their whole hearts and minds, every aspect of their strength in their life, Lord, and that your light would illumine us and perfect us and keep us until the time appointed for us to meet with you that you be glorified in all that we say and that we do. We thank you for the great gift of your love, mercy, and presence in our lives. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen.